Hello guys, welcome to my video. So today I'm going to be explaining uh, the May June 2019 paper 13 for physics, and the question paper is one hour minute. Uh, hello guys, welcome to my video. So today I'm going to be explaining the May June 2019 question paper 13 for physics, and the question paper is one hour 15 minutes long. And I'm going to be going through each and every question so that you can be able to understand how they were uh, worked out and you can be able to see each and every step that is done when making these calculations. So I highly recommend that you watch the whole video. But if you have a specific part that you are really interested in, you can follow my timestamps that I have put on my video so that you can be able to access a specific question that you uh, you would need assistance in and um, you can be able to get help. OK, so let's begin. Starting off with question number one, we've been asked which is an A side base unit. And according to AS, uh, this is, as you can see on the screen, these are the A side base units that you're required to know. And these are basically the quantities that cannot be broken down any further or any simpler. I give you an example. The mass of an apple is 200 grams. You can't break that down any further. You just know it because it's fundamental. In a similar way, the Kelvin is the A side base unit for temperature. Okay, so the A side base unit for temperature is the Kelvin. So whenever we have a thermometer and we, we might be given degrees Celsius, but the SI base unit will be the Kelvin, which is C. Uh, moving to question number two, um, we've been given osmium, okay, osmium, uh, which is a naturally occurring element that has a density of 23,000 kg meters per meters cubed. What is also a value of the density of osmium? Okay, so one thing that we must appreciate here is these units themselves, which are almost consistent throughout that we've been given grams per centimeter cubed. So what we can do is we can try to express 23,000 kgs per meter cubed in dm cubed, right? Oh, sorry, in grams per cubic centimeter so that we can be able um, to get a better view of what's going on, okay? So 23,000 um, kilograms is basically, we know that one kg is about 1,000 grams, okay? So 23,000 kgs will basically be we multiply that by a thousand. Okay, we end up with twenty three thousand times one thousand gives us twenty three million grams. Okay, so we have the mass part covered out, but we want to find out how much one cubic meter is in cubic centimeters. Okay, so we know that one cubic meter is basically one meter. Okay, times one meter times one meter, but a meter is made up of hundred centimeters, so it's going to be one hundred times 100 times 100 and that's going to give you 1 million okay centimeter cubed right so basically if you were to evaluate this the density that you're going to calculate is going to be that 23 million okay that 23 million divided by 1 million okay so all of these cancel out so basically it's going to be equivalent to 23 grams per cubic decimeter so we want to prove out of a b c d which answer is closest to that? Let's first start with A, okay? So with A, we have 2.3, okay, times 10 to the power of 4. That is micro, which is times 10 to the power of negative 6. So since we have micro, which is times 10 to the power of negative 6, if we equate this, we're going to get 0 0.023 grams per dm cubed. And that is nowhere near the actual answer that we're trying to evaluate. And if you look at B, B is actually 2.3 times 10 to the power of 4 grams per cubic decimeter. But this is nowhere near 23 grams per cubic decimeter. It doesn't make sense. It's like literally 2.3 times 10 to the power of 4. So it cannot be um, cannot be B. And if we look at C, we're given 2.3 kgs in grams is like times 10 to the power of 3, which is like times 1,000. This is going to give you basically, so if you multiply that by 1,000, it's going to give about 2,300 Okay, 2,300 grams per cubic centimeter, and that is nowhere near the correct accurate value. But if you go to D, D is going to be 2.3 times 10 to the power of negative 2 times 10 to the power of 3. So that's going to be about 2.3 times 10, which is going to just give you 23 grams per cubic decimeter. So D will be the correct answer. Move on to question number 3. We'll be given two tugs that are towing an oil rig. So we have tug 1 and tug 2. And the tensions in the towing uh, cables are 4 and 5 uh, kilonewtons. What is the total force acting on the rig due to the cables in the direction to the east? So this is the direction to the east. And what you're going to do is you're going to resolve. 
So this is basically how resolving vectors work, right? So you have a vector that is acting in that particular direction. So if you were to resolve that vector, you're going to express it in such a way that you can be able to find the component in that direction. For example, what we want is the component of four neutrons that is in the east, which is going to be this component. That is the component that we're mainly interested in. The same for the bottom part, we're mainly interested in this component that is also acting in the east. So how do you find the first one, the component that is there? As you can see, this is 20 degrees, right? We know that, we know that cos theta is equivalent to the adjacent divided by, okay, um, divided by the hypotenuse, okay, which is a fact, right? So it means that the adjacent will basically be your hypotenuse, okay, times cos theta. So if you look here, we want to find this adjacent, which is, let's say, just A. We want to find this adjacent, and we have the hypotenuse, which is like the longer line, which is inclined at that angle, which is 4. So basically, we can find that component by just saying 4 cos of 20, right? So basically, we can find that component by using that law. And then here, we can have literally 5 cos um, of 50, right? So since both of these are the ones which are acting in this direction, the total force, what does it mean? It means that you're adding both of things, uh, these things up. So basically, for the total, okay, so for the total force, you're literally going to say um, 5 cos 50, okay? Then you're going to add the other component, which is 4 cos um, of 20, and that's going to give you about 3.75877 plus 3.21393. Um, that's going to give you a total of about 6.972, which is going to be about 7.0 kilonewtons, right? This is still in kilonewtons, and the answer is going to be R to be C. Moving to question number four, we've been asked the approximate kinetic energy of an Olympic athlete when running at a maximum speed during a 100-meter uh, race. So basically, the athlete that comes to my mind that I remember is Usain Bolt, he was one of the fastest, uh, literally, he, had, he has the record of being the fastest man alive. Uh, in 2009 World Championships, he ran 100 meters in like 9.62 seconds, right? So let's just use him as an example, right? So let's assume that he weighs like 60 kilograms, like right? an average athlete might weigh about 60 to 80 kilograms, right? So let's just say 60. We know that the kinetic energy, okay, we know that the kinetic energy is going to be one half multiplied by the mass multiplied by the velocity squared, right? So it's going to be one half. Let's assume that they weigh 60 kilograms, right? In Usain uh, Bolt's example, for example, um, he ran like 100 meters in about oh no, 9.63 seconds, right? So we can actually find his speed. You know that V is equal to the distance over time, which is going to be 100 divided by 9.63. That's going to give you about um, about 10, 10 meters per second. So that was pretty fast. He was running about 10 meters just in one second. You say one, he has already completed 10 meters. That is pretty fast. So we can then calculate the kinetic energy that he possessed when he was running at that maximum speed, right? Which is going to be 10, and that's going to be squared, and that's going to give you a value of 3,000 joules. And the closest one, as you can see from that, this is 400, 4,000, 40,000, 400,000. The closest one is going to be B. The important thing about these approximations, or they're usually called reasonable estimates, is you must at least be close to the true value as possible because they will just give you the same prefixes. If you had 5,000, 9,000, 10,000, you still get your answer as B. It won't be C because C is way, way big. So that's the thing about estimates. Just try to get an answer that is as close um, as possible. Very important. I'll move to question number five. We've been given the diagram showing the reading on uh, an analog ammeter. So we've been asked which digital ammeter reading is the same as the reading on the analog ammeter. Okay, so we're given that ammeter and we've been asked to find the digital ammeter reading that corresponds to what we have been given above. Okay, so if we look here, this is zero, okay, and this is one, okay, and this is two, this is three, and this is four, then we go to five. What does it mean? It means that we have one, two, three, four, five increments and they all have a value of one. So if five increments have a value of one, one increment should have a value of 0 0.2. So if you are here, this is going to be 1.2, 1.4, 1.6. So this is going to have a value of 1.6, um, but it's going to be milliamps. So you want to prove from A to D, which one of these is going to be 1.6. So let's start from D. We have 1.6, but it's in amps, not milliamps. So D is wrong. If you go on to C, this is 16 milliamps, which is 
16 times 10 to the power of negative 3. And this cannot be 1.6 milliamps. So C is wrong. We've got to be, this is about 160 times 10 to the power of negative 6, which is not correct. So B is wrong. And if you go to A, it's going to be 1,600 times 10 to the power of negative 6, which is going to be 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 3 amps, which is going to be 1.6 milliamps. So the correct answer um, is A. Very important. Move on to question number 6. We've been given a micrometer screw gauge, which is used to measure the diameter of a small uniform steel sphere. And as you can see on the diagram, if you haven't seen a micrometer screw gauge, I'm showing it right now on the screen. That is the micrometer screw gauge. And that is the steel sphere that we're trying to measure um, its volume, okay? So how do you find the volume of a steel sphere? We know that the volume is going to be 4 over 3 pi r cubed. So we know that the volume is going to be 4 over 3 pi r cubed. So we want to find the volume of that. So we're going to use the diameter during the computation because this micrometer screw gauge is going to measure the diameter and our goal is to find the percentage uncertainty in the calculation of the volume of the sphere. So we know that the radius is going to be, okay, the radius times two is going to be the diameter, okay? So the radius is going to be the diameter divided by two. So if we go in that co uh, calculation, V is going to be four over three pi times D over two um, cubed. So how do you find the percentage uncertainty in V? We can use the percentage uncertainty in D. Because the percentage uncertainty in V is going to be, since there's a power of 3, the rule with uncertainties is that if you're adding them up, right, you always add the uncertainties. But whenever you have powers, it's three times of that because you have D1, another D, and another D because it's D cubed. So you're going to say 3 times the percentage uncertainty in the value of D. So you're going to go start 3 times. For D, it's 0 0.01 divided by 5.00 multiplied by 100 to get the percentage and this is going to give you an answer of approximately uh, 0 0.6 so an answer of approximately 0 0.6 and the answer is c before question number seven we've been given the variation of velocity v with time t of an object the object passes a fixed point at time t is equals to zero what is the displacement of the object from the fixed point and what is the acceleration of the object? So we've been asked two questions to find number one, the displacement and number two, to find the acceleration. What do we know? We know that the displacement, okay, we know that D is going to be the area under, okay, a velocity time graph. And we know that the acceleration, right, is going to be the gradient of that graph or we just calculated as V minus U divided by T. So what is the area underneath this graph? This is your whole area, right? This is basically what you're trying to find. And by calculating this, this is going to be your overall displacement, the overall displacement that this object has actually um, encountered, right? So this area A is what we're going to find. And as you can see, A is actually a trapezium. So how do you find the area of a trapezium? We're going to start. It's going to be one half, okay, A plus B multiplied by h. What is going to be a value of a? It's going to be these two long sides. So let's assume this is b. This is going to be a. Then this is going to be h, right? So the area is going to be one half the value of a, which is 4, plus the value of a b, which is 24, multiplied by the height, which is actually 5. You compute this, you're going to get an answer of 70 meters. So you're going to eliminate a and you're going to eliminate c. So you have a 50% probability of getting, basically you have a 50% chance of getting the correct answer. The next part, we're going to look at the acceleration, okay? So we know that the acceleration is going to be V minus U divided by T. So ask yourself, what is the final velocity? It's 24. The initial velocity is going to be 4. And we're going to divide by the time, which is going to be 5. So basically, that's going to give you 20 divided by 5. So it's going to be 20 divided by 5. And it's going to give you an answer of 4 meters per second squared. So you have the value of your displacement, you have the value of your acceleration, and the answer is going to be uh, B. Move on question number eight. A skydiver jumps for an aeroplane. So we have an aeroplane over there. And our skydiver, as you can see, is, jump is jumping from the plane. And they're going to fall vertically through the air, which graph shows a variation of the skydiver vertical velocity. 
We don't know why the skydiver is jumping, but you know, they're just jumping and they're falling through the air. But the most important thing that I want you to note is this thing where they say they're falling through the air. Whenever you hear the word air, all of the stuff, they're basically implying to air resistance. So air resistance is going to be present whenever something falls in air, right? So air resistance is going to be um, present. And the effect of air resistance is that it increases as the velocity of the skydiver increases. So as the skydiver moves to the higher velocity, the air resistance is going to increase. But the skydiver is stationary at the aeroplane, right? So the skydiver cannot be starting with a velocity initially. It doesn't make sense. So B is already wrong because it's already starting with a certain velocity. They are literally standing um, on the aeroplane before they jump. So they can't already have a velocity. They have to build up that velocity, right? So um, B is going to be wrong. And if you look at, uh, at A, right, it's going to have a constant gradient, meaning that the acceleration is going to be is going to be um is going to be constant but the acceleration cannot be constant why because we have air resistance and we know that if the person is falling the weight minus the air resistance is going to be mass multiplied by the acceleration so if this air resistance is going to increase this acceleration is also supposed to decrease right it's also supposed to decrease because it means that the weight minus the acceleration is going to decrease, 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 decrease until it reaches zero when these two are equal. So the gradient is supposed to be horizontal whenever they're equal. And if you look at uh, at C, this is when the gradient is almost approaching um, being vertical. So the answer is going um, to be C. Very important. And D is wrong because it's already starting with an acceleration of zero. And how can it start with an acceleration of zero? It doesn't make sense. So the answer is going to be D. Move on to question number nine. We've been given a nucleus that collides with a stationary nucleus in a vacuum. The diagram shows the path of the two nuclei before and after the collision. No other particles are involved in the collision, which diagram is not possible. So basically, you need to understand this. Look at how the collision is happening. Basically, you have a horizontal collision that's going to happen before. Let's start with A. You're going to have a horizontal uh, um, motion that's going to be like that and both of these two you can literally resolve them because you can resolve them like you can resolve this component so that it's more like this and you can also resolve this component so that it's much more like uh, like that okay so you have a blend of these two different components that are just both acting in that same direction so they can also be in the vertical because this can also be down in the vertical right meaning that your momentum is conserved because we're interested in momentum being conserved in the x and momentum being conserved in the y so that sort of caters for that because we can resolve the momentum right and if you go to this one we can resolve both of these two momentum such that they act in the horizontal and we can also resolve one to be acting up and the other one to be acting down meaning that b is wrong because it is possible right because momentum balances out but if you look at d for example this one slightly to the vertical and then that one slightly going to be resolved upwards. They cancel out. This one's going to move slightly to that direction and then that one slightly to that direction. They cancel out. So momentum is conserved both in the X and both in the Y. But look at C. Both of these two are sort of inclined to this direction. If we were to resolve them, they're all going to point down, right? One is going to point down and the other is also going to point down. And there's nothing pointing upwards, right? So it is not possible because momentum in the Y is not conserved. Momentum in the Y is not conserved, okay? But momentum in the X is conserved, right? But in the Y, it's not conserved because before and after, we have that motion. So C is not going to be possible and our answer is going to be C. Move on to question number 10. And we're given a uniform electric field, okay? So this is a topic on electric fields and we no longer do electric fields in the syllabus from 2022 going onwards. So we I will not be covering um, this question. And we're going to go to question number 11. And we're given a picture that is suspended from a nail by a single cord and connected to two points, X and point Y, okay? So there is negligible friction between the cord. So here there is negligible friction. So that the tension in both the cords is the same. Okay, so let's... I would highly recommend as you are reading the question, follow through, right? So this is going to be your tension and that is going to be a tension and it's going to remain the same, okay? And the picture hangs symmetrically, right? So meaning that they're both like going to be equal on both sides, okay? The tension in the cord is T. The angle between the cord and the vertical is going to be theta on both sides, okay? So 
Basically, we can resolve this t into this component, which is going to be t cos theta. And we can resolve this into the other component, which is going to be t cos theta, right? So these two components adding up, they'll give you a total of 2t cos theta. And this is going to be equal to, this painting is going to have a weight, right? This picture is going to have a weight that will be acting down. And it's going to be equal to these two guys, which are going to be acting up. So you're going to get 2t cos theta, okay? So you're going to get 2t cos theta being equivalent to your weight, right? So 2t, okay, cos theta is going to be equivalent to your w. So let's start from D. They say that the weight of the picture is equivalent to t cos theta. That is incorrect because the weight of the picture is equivalent to 2t cos theta. Let's go to C. Moving point x and y to the top edge of the picture while keeping their distance apart and the length constant would reduce the tension in the code. Okay, so let's follow what they're doing, right? So try to follow um, what they're doing. So basically, they're going to move point x and point y to the top edge of the picture, keeping their distance constant and the length has to be constant, right? So for the length of this to be constant, you can't just move this upwards. You have to also move this nail up, okay? In order for that length to remain constant. What do I mean by this? Well, since we have things like this, they want to move x and y up so that we can keep the length constant again. So let's remove this, okay? So if we're to remove this, right? And let's try to follow what they're saying, okay? So if we're to remove this, what they're basically saying is they're going to move x and y upwards, okay? So x and y is going to change its position, right? So it was once here, but x and y are now going to move upwards. Let's move them up. Let's say we're going to move them here. This is going to be x, and this is going to be y, right? So your nail has to move up so that the length remains the same. You're going to get something like this. You're going to get something like this. This will not change the angle theta. Why? Because you're literally going to shift this whole thing just upwards, right? X and Y. And that's not going to change the whole angle theta because for this length to remain constant, we also moved the nail. The nail was once here and we moved it up so that the length remains constant, right? So we're not, because if we didn't move the nail up, remember, it would just be taut, right? It won't even stand because if you put it like this, right? It's just going to be, you know, something like this, right? Like that, right? So we could do that or rather, if we just put it up, the whole picture is going to fall down, right? That might make much more sense. So even if we keep the nail in that position, the whole picture is just going to fall down. And if the whole picture fall down, it's just going to still, it's still going to be the same thing, right? The value of theta is just not going to change, right? So uh, C is not going to make much sense because the value of the angle theta will not make sense, right? If we're going to move these two upwards, the whole picture might just move down and the value of, um, of theta would, would just not reduce, it would remain the same. So C is wrong, right? So the two methods that you could keep the length constant is either you move the nail up or do you just let the picture fall down, right? Depends on what you want um, to keep constant. Moving on to point C, moving point X and Y further apart, okay, on the picture while keeping the length of the chord constant. Okay, okay, okay. So we're moving X and Y quite further apart. So let's try that. So we're gonna move X and Y. Okay, so we're gonna do this, right? And we're gonna move x and y further apart, right? So let's try it. Um, okay. So let's move x somewhere here, right? And let's move y somewhere here, right? So it's basically going to be like this, right? So the whole picture is you move it like that, meaning that um, it's going to be something like this, okay? Something like this, right? Okay, just keep that in mind. So if we're going to pull them apart, it's going to be something like this, like this, basically, right? But previously, our angle theta was once like this. And by us mush pushing these things much more further apart, we're actually going to cause the angle theta to increase, right? So this angle theta is actually going to increase, right? And as angle theta increases, what do we know? From this equation, we know that T is equivalent to W over 2 cos theta. As angle theta increases, all of this, this cos theta is going to decrease. Hence, the value of t is going to increase. Why? Because cos 70, cos 70 literally um, is going to be, okay, is going to be 0 0.34. But when you have cos 90, it's going to be 0. So the bigger the value of theta, the smaller cos theta is going to be. So the bigger the value of t is going to be. So 
Moving the points x further apart is going to increase the angle theta and is actually going to increase the tension. Because the more you increase theta, you're going to force the tension because the, the picture is going to be that that angle theta is going to increase and the value of cos theta will begin um, to decrease. And as cos theta decreases, the tension has to increase to keep everything constant, right? Very important. But if you move on to A, right, in A, we're increasing the length of the cord, right, with point X and Y in the same picture, and that would reduce the tension. So literally, we're going to increase the length of this cord. So it's going to fall down, but it's now going to have a longer length, right? So if we're going to remove everything, right, so if we, if we were to remove everything, and we're now going to put a longer length, so what's going to happen is if we have something that's quite long, let's say, let's just assume it's going to fall down, so that the nail will be somewhere over here and it's going to fall down, right? What's going to happen is this is now going to be your value of theta and this is now going to be your value of theta, right? So your value of theta is actually going to decrease. So the value of theta actually decreases. And if theta decreases, cos theta is going to decrease and the value of t is also, um, cos theta is going to increase if the value of theta decreases and the value of t will be reduced. So the answer will be A. It was a bit tricky um, to wrap your head around that, but basically you have to prove that what is going to happen is you move, uh, the weight is going to be equal to 2t cos theta, and as you move point x and y to the top edge of the picture, it's just going to have the same tension, right? Because it's literally going to be the same thing, but just going to translate downwards. And as you move x and y, you're sort of um, increasing that angle theta because x is now a bit further, y is a bit further, so theta is going to increase. As theta increases, cos theta is going to decrease, hence your tension is going to increase. But increasing the length is going to decrease the value of that angle theta. And as that angle theta decreases, you're going to increase um, the value of cos theta. Therefore, you're going to decrease the tension and your answer is going to be A. Very important. We've got question 12. I mean, given a sharp sign, sign that weighs 75 uh, newtons that hangs from a frame and is attached to a vertical wall, like that. The frame consists of a horizontal rod, xy, and a road YZ, um, which is at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal. Road XY is attached to the wall, okay, at the hinge X. And we need to assume that the weights of the roads are negligible. What is the horizontal force exerted by the wall on road XY? Okay, so basically, we're going to have tension that is going to be in this rope, right? But if we have tension, we can resolve it into two components, right? We can resolve it into this vertical component, which is over here. Okay, and this component is going to be T sine of um, of 30, right? That's going to be your vertical component that's going to be acting upwards, right? So let's take this as the pivot, right? We can also resolve this force in this direction. And then this is going to be T cos 30, right? So at X, it's going to exert a force that's going to be in this direction. Why? Because the resultant force at the end of the day has to be zero. So if the tension as a component of uh, of ten the tension is a component in the horizontal there's going to be a force in x in the horizontal so those two forces are going to cancel out giving a total resultant force um that is going to be zero so first we need t sine theta how are we going to find that we're going to apply the principle of moments what do we know we know that the clockwise moments okay the sum of the clockwise moments is equivalent to the sum of the anti-clockwise moments right so if you ask yourself what is clockwise if you look at a clock right? Clockwise is if you're moving in that direction and anti-clockwise is if you're moving in the other direction. So as you can see from here, this is going to be clockwise, right? And this is going to be anti-clockwise, right? Anti-clockwise. And this is going to be clockwise, right? So for the clockwise, it's going to be 75 multiplied by 0 0.5. That's going to be equal to T sine theta, T sine 30 times 0 0.5. So the value of your tension, right, is going to be 75 times 0 0.5 divided by sine 30 times 0 0.5, right? This cancel out. So you're going to get your value of T going to be equivalent to 150 newtons, right? So if T is equal to 150, therefore for us to find the horizontal component, right? So for us to find the horizontal of T, it's just going to be T cos of 30, which is going to be 150 times cos of 30, which is just going to give us 1, um, 129.9, which is just going to be 130 newtons. And the answer is going to be uh, C. Very important. 
Moving on to T, what is the talk of a couple, right? Because we've been asked, what is the talk of the couple that has been shown? But how do you know first if it's going to be a couple? What is a couple? A couple is a pair, right? A pair of forces that have the following characteristics. Number one, they're equal in magnitude. Very important, right? Okay. Number two, they're going to be opposite in direction. Okay. So equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. And number three, they're going to be separated by a distance r. Okay, they're going to be separated by a distance, um, a distance r. Okay, so if you have two forces that are opposite, as you can see, 15 and 15, same magnitude, opposite in direction, and separated by a distance r, therefore those two are actually going to be um a couple because they're going to meet those criterions. So how do you find the torque of a couple? The torque of a couple basically is going to be one of the force multiplied by the distance between the two forces. So one of the forces is going to be 15 multiplied by the distance between them, which is 5 over 100. Basically, that's going to give you 0 0.75 um, newton meters, right? 0 0.75 newton meters, your answer is going to be A. Very important. Move on to question 14. We'll be given water, which is a density of 1 gram per dm cubed, the serene having a distance of 1.3 grams per dm cubed, and a student measures out a volume of 40 cubic centimeters of glycerine into a container. The student adds um, water to the container to make a mixture of water and glycerine. Assume that the total volume of the water and glycerine does not change. What does this mean? For example, if here I'm mixing water and glycerine, they will never mix, meaning that they are going to um, remain separated, right? As two different things, they won't mix up, reducing the volume, right? Basically. So a student now wants to find the volume of water that is needed to make a mixture of density 1.1. So I want you to get this fact. This is very important whenever you want to solve this question because this is what I call a topic of density of mixtures. And there are going to be a certain principles or certain assumptions that we're going to make that are going to help you whenever you solve these, uh, these problems, right? So let's start. Whenever you have a mixture problem, you should always ask yourself this particular thing. How do I find the density of my mixture? So the density of your mixture is going to be the total mass divided by the total volume. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you mix. You just need the total mass and you're going to divide by the total volume. Okay, let's start with water. Right, let's start with water. What is the density of water? The density of water is going to be 1.0 gram per dm cubed. Okay, what is the mass of water? Let's just say it's going to be mw. What is the volume of water? Let's just say it's going to be vw, right? So those are the facts that we're going to have, right? So what do we know? We know that density is equivalent to the mass divided by the volume, okay? So your density is going to be 1. Your mass is going to be mw divided by your volume is going to be vw, right? So basically, mw is going to be equivalent to vw, right? We're just going to keep this aside. We might use it somewhere. So we're just going to keep this um, aside. Let's go on to the other one, right? Let's go on to glycerine, right? So as we compare glycerine, okay? So let's look at glycerine. Let's start with the density of glycerine, right? The density of glycerine is going to be 1.3, okay? So for glycerine, its density is going to be 1.3. And the mass of glycerine, okay? The mass of glycerine is going to be, we don't know the mass, right? That's what we want to find, okay? We don't know the mass, which is unknown. But the volume of glycerine is going to be 40. Follow with me. The density is going to be 40 dm cubed, right? So I'm working for water and I'm working for glycerine separately. There are some of the tricks when working paper one equations. Be very clear and thorough with how you work. No one is going to mark this, of course, but it's going to help you as you're going to be solving your problems, right? So I know that density, right? I'm, and I know that it's just important. I'm just going to do it. I know that density will be equivalent to my mass divided by volume. So my mass is going to be my density multiplied by volume. My density is going to be 1.3 and my volume is going to be 40. It's going to give me a total of about um, 52, right? So the total is going to be 52 grams, right? So now these are the two facts that I have. Let's combine this, right? Let's combine this. Let's go back to our mixture. 
Okay, and let's try to combine this. Very important. So the density of your mixture is going to be your total mass divided by your total volume, right? So your density for the mixture, you've been told that the density is um, 1.1, right? Because that's the density that you're going to have. So the density is going to be 1.1. What is your total mass? The mass of water. We don't know the mass of water, right? But we just know it's equal to its volume. Plus, the mass of glycerin going to be 52 over. The mass of uh, the volume of glycerin is going to be 40. Plus, the volume of water is going to be VW, right? But, okay, but MW is going to be equivalent to VW. So 1.1 is going to be VW plus 52 divided by 40 plus VW, okay? So you're going to have um, 11, 1.11 times 40 plus VW, okay? It's going to be equivalent to VW plus, um, plus 52. So this is going to give you 1.1 VW, okay? Plus 1.1 times 40 is going to be 44. It's going to be equivalent to VW plus, again, 52. Okay, so you're going to have 1.1 VW minus 1.0 VW, which is going to be equivalent to 52 minus uh, 44. Then you're going to have 0 0.1, okay? So this is going to be 0 0.1, sorry. This is going to be 0 0.1 VW, which is going to be equivalent to 8. So VW is going to be equivalent to 80 cubic centimeters, right? So the answer is going to be a D. So as you can see, it's a lot of calculation. But the thing about physics is once you know that density is equal to total mass over volume, the rest is just mathematical manipulation. So what I did is I worked with water separately. What is its density? What is its mass? What is its volume? I had that information. I went to glycerin. What is its density? What is its mass? What is its volume? I had that information. For the mixture, it's just a matter of me adding the water, the volume of water and glycerin, adding the volume of glycerin and water, and me finding the density of the mixture, then the density of mixture was already given, then me finding the volume, um, and the answer is going to be D. Very important. We want question 15, which statement about the principle of conservation of energy is correct. Let's start with the first one. Energy conversion helps to conserve energy sources. How true is that? How does energy conversion help to conserve energy sources? Let's see. Um, we can consider like coal, right? It's an energy source. How does energy conversion help us conserve coal, right? For example, if we're heating coal, it's going to give us thermal energy. That's conservation, conservation right? We had chemical energy in the coal. Then now it's going to give us thermal energy. But how is it really like, you know, helping us conserve the sources? Because like we're depleting the, the, the water, the, the source of the coal, but we're sort of saving the energy in a way. So A doesn't make much sense, right? Energy is conserved only systems with an efficiency of 100%. That is not correct. Because you can still conserve energy. Energy conservation basically means that the energy doesn't change. It doesn't go anywhere. It might go to a form that you don't want, but it didn't really change, right? It's still the same. It's still the kinetic energy that you have. Now it's like friction. Now it's like, you know, thermal energy, but it's still there, right? The supply of energy is limited, so B is wrong. The supply of energy is limited, so energy should be conserved. Well, we know that, you know, like supply of energy is limited, right? But that's not like... Well, that doesn't make sense. Like how, you know, how do you conserve energy just because the supply of energy is limited? Like it's not going to make sense, right? But the total amount of energy in a closed system is going to remain constant. That is true. Because in a closed system, all the energy that you put in will be maintained in that system. So it's not going to change. And it's the total amount. It doesn't matter what you have, right? The total amount of energy is just going to remain constant. And the answer is going to be um, D. But for question 16, we've been given a student that can run or walk up the stairs to her classroom. We segment describes the power required and the gravitational potential gained while the student runs up the stairs. As you can see, the student is running up the stairs from point A up until point B. But here's the tricky part. The gravitational potential energy is going to be the same. Why? Because we know that delta EPE, right? Delta GPE, which is the gravitational potential energy, is going to be equivalent to M G H. Is the mass of the students going to change? No. Is the value of G going to change? No. Is the height of the staircase going to change? No. So it doesn't matter whether the student crawls, runs, walks. She can do whatever she wants, but the height is going to remain the same. It doesn't matter. 
the mass of the student, whether she runs, walks, or crawls, is not going to change. The value of g is not going to change. So they're going to have the same gravitational potential energy. I hope it makes sense. So a and b are going to be wrong on that fact because they can't have more gravitational potential energy, right? Then in terms of power, if you're running, you need more power than if you're walking. Like, like logically, if you're going to run, you're going to need a lot of power and you're going to need, um, and you're going to need, you know, um, yeah. So if you're going to run, you're going to need a lot of power. How I thought about this is that power is going to be the work done divided by the time, right? So the work that you're going to do is you run up is going to be, of course, maybe it might be the same, right? Doesn't matter. But the time is going to be less, right? The time is going to decrease because you're running. The time is going to be shorter. But as time decreases, the value of P is going to increase, right? Literally, the value of P is going to be bigger because the time has decreased. So you're going to use more power. Another way you can also think about this is we know that power is equal to FV. So a greater velocity also means a greater power. So those are all the different techniques that you can use. But basically, running uses more power, right? If you're running, you're going to, you know, start painting. You're going to start, like, feeling deprivation of oxygen, right? Basically, you're going to need more power, okay? Move on to question 17. You'll be given a lead pellet that is shot vertically upwards into a clay block. That is stationary at the moment of impact, but is able to rise freely after the impact. So the pellet hits the block with an initial vertical um, velocity of 200 meters. It embeds itself in the block and does not emerge. How high above the initial position of the block, um, the initial position will the block rise? Very important. Okay. So what do we know? We know that momentum is going to be conserved. So momentum before, okay, so momentum before is going to be equal to the momentum that is going to be after. What is the momentum before? The momentum before is 200, which is the velocity, times the mass, which is 5 over 1,000. That's going to be equal to after. They're going to embed. So here's what's going to happen, right? Let's, let's make this up so that it makes sense because we want to find the velocity after this is happening, right? So we want to find this value of V. Okay, so... If you look at this, this pellet, right? Let's 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 remove it, right? And let's try to accelerate it upwards as it's going to move, right? So when I have this pellet, okay, which is over here, right? And we're gonna try to, okay, and we're gonna try to move that pellet, right? So that it can be able to move and get embedded inside um inside this particular stationary clay. Okay, so what's going on is Right, let's look at our clay here. Okay. Okay. So let's look at our, our pellet, which is over here. So basically, this pellet is going to move, right? So the pellet, let's say it's over here, right? It's going to move and move and move and move and move upwards and moves and moves and moves upwards. And it's going to emerge itself over here. Right. So it's going to emerge itself inside this particular thing. And then this whole system, right? This whole system altogether is going to move upwards, right? Because they're now going to move together, but they're going to move together at one velocity. So we're basically going to treat every single thing. We're basically going to treat all of this as one complete system. So the mass is going to be, since this is a mass of 5 and this is a mass of 95, they're going to move as one particular thing. So it's like the, 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 the pellet never existed at all. They're now one thing, which is going to have a mass of 100 divided by 1000. You're going to get a value of V, which is going to be equivalent to 2. 200 times 5 over 1,000 divided by 100 over 1,000. That's going to give you a value of V, which is going to be 10 meters per second. So they're going to move at a value of V, which is going to be 10 meters per second. And we just want to find how high above its initial position will the block rise. So it's going to rise and rise and rise and rise and rise. And it's going to reach a position, maybe same, say here, right, where the value of V is going to be 0, right? But we know that U is going to be 10 because of our calculation, right? So I can use V squared is going to be u squared minus 2as to find the value of s because I know that the value of v, either way, this value is going to equate to zero, right? So u squared is going to be equivalent to 2as. So my value of s is going to be equivalent to u squared divided by 2a. So my value of a is going to be 10 squared divided by 2 times 9.81. That's going to give you a value of approximately um, 5.1. 5.1 meters, right? So that's 
how you had to think about this they're going to embed and they're all going to travel up then you can apply newton's kinematic uh, laws of equation very important well, for question 18 we'll be given the surface of a planet and 30 joules of work is what is done against gravity to raise a mass of one kilogram through a height of 10 meters now we don't know what planet this is so let's start we know that gpe is going to be mgh so a gpe is going to be 30 and the mass is going to be one okay and the value of g we don't know but we just know that the height is going to be 10. so a value of g is going to be 30 divided by 1 times 10 so a value of g is going to be 3 meters per second squared now i only know of um of mercury right because i only know that mercury has a value of g of about 3.61 mars has a value of g of about 3.75 right so those are part of some of the planets that i know which have a value of g close to three but it doesn't matter right it doesn't matter what planet it is it's just additional information right so how do you find the value of uh gpe okay so the value of gpe is going to be equivalent to mg multiplied by h right so the m is going to be basically 4 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 5.0 4 by 3 by 5.0 is basically going to give you 60 joules of energy 60 joules and the answer is going to be a b very important let's move on question 19 we begin with four solid steel rods each of length 2 cross-sectional area 250 and each supporting an object of 4 of 10 the weight of the object causes the road to contract by 0 0.10 the roads obey hook's law um what is the young modulus of the steel okay so you have four steel rods that are that are sort of you know supporting a load and the road obey hook's law right so we've been asked to find the young modulus of um of the steel okay so how is this going to work right so we have four four steels right which are one is there one is there one is there and the other one is uh is maybe over here right and they're all going to carry a load right so they're basically going to carry a load like this okay and that load is going to weigh right that load is going to weigh ten thousand ten thousand newtons right but i don't know how they are positioned you don't really need this but the position is such a way that the roads contract by 0 0.10. So they're getting smaller by us putting that weight. It's a pre it's pretty odd. Like, how is it going to contract by putting weight? But it's not really necessary in us solving the question because that's just the value of extension. Remember, extension can be like a positive extension or a negative extension, right? But still, contraction by 0 0.10 is still going to be that extension, right? But basically, if we have 10,000 and we have four roads, one road is going to get 2,500, right? Because if you have 10 roads, one road is going to get 2,500 um, newtons. So how do we find the Young Modulus? We know that the Young Modulus is going to be the value of your stress divided by the value of your strain. And you know that stress is force divided by area. Strain is the extension per unit length. So this is going to be your force times your length divided by your area times your extension. What is your force? Your force is going to be, if you go here, going to be 2,500. What is your length? 2.0. What is your area? It's going to be 250 milli means times 10 to the power of negative 3. You're going to square that because we have this squared over here. You're going to multiply by extension, which is 0 0.10 times 10 to the power of negative 3. You're basically going to get an answer of 2.0 times 10 to the power of 11 pascals or Newton m to the power of negative 2 and the answer is going to be a b very important over well, question 20 a wire is attached at one end to a fixed point a tensile force f is applied to the other end um, of the wire causing it to extend so if a wire okay let's draw it visually so you can be able to understand i love visual aids because they really help you conceptualize and really understand the question much easily so you have a wire here okay and you're just at, at causing it, it um a tensile force let's just say this is a tensile force f so that it's going to extend right something like that so this is shown by this graph okay the force is then gradually decreased to zero and the wire contracts this is shown 
on the graph by the line PQ. Which area on the graph represents the work done as the wire contracts? So basically, this work done is the area underneath the graph that you will be working with. The force extension graph. The area under it is going to be, um, is going to be your work done, right? So you can ask yourself, what is going to be your area underneath this graph? And this is going to be your area, right? So that's going to be area as it is going to contract. It's going to go back. And this is going to be your area as it begins to contract, right? So this area A, as you can see, this is actually um, P, right? So this area A, so this area A, this is actually P, okay? Q and then R, right? Or it can be Q, P, R, Q, which is going to be R, C. So the answer is C. Move on to question 21. The diagram shows the variation of displacement Y with distance X along a progressive wave. So the started waves, very important topic. It creates a lot of marks, more than 10 marks at times. Um, so you have to really know a lot of concepts when it comes to waves. So you've been asked to find the phase difference between points P and Q. So basically, phase difference is a measure of how much one particle is out of phase of another, right? How much it lags or leads behind another particle or one wave leading or lagging behind another wave. But when comparing two particles, you're going to need two formulas, right? So I'll teach you the first formula. We know that phi, which is the phase difference, is going to be 2 pi t divided by t. This only applies if you have a displacement time graph. Do you have a displacement time graph in this case? No. You have a displacement distance time graph. So you're going to need something a bit different. So the value for phi is now going to be 2 pi, the value of x, divided by the value of lambda. So you ask yourself, you have two particles. What is their value of x? What is the difference between the length of those two particles? Then you have the value of lambda. You're going to ask yourself, what is my value of lambda? And once you have those two values, you can then find your value of phi. But in degrees, this is again going to be, right? This can also be expressed in degrees. It's going to be 2 pi, which is just basically 360, right? So this can also be expressed as 360 x divided by lambda. Right? So the answer is going to be somewhere along this particular line. Right? So you basically need, if you're here and you're here, what is your value of x and what is your value of lambda? Right. So we don't have actual distances, so we can just probably approximate because we know that if you're going to move here, if you're going to start here, right, and you're going to move here, okay, across to this point, that's going to be one lambda, right? That's like literally one lambda. But as you go up here, to this point, that's going to be half lambda. So literally, you have one and a half lambda, right? So here, you're going to go, you have 360 times 1.5 lambda divided by lambda. So these two cancel out, and you're left with 360 times 1.5. That's going to give you 540 degrees, and your answer is C. Very important. Um, 22. Wave power generators take advantage of the energy that is transferred by the motion of the waves across the surface of the oceans. The energy of a wave depends on its amplitude. What is the correct definition of amplitude? Amplitude is very simple. You need to know this, guys. Amplitude is the maximum displacement of a point on the wave from equilibrium. That is what the amplitude um, actually is. So your answer is going to be C. What is D? The number of oscillations of a wave that occur per second, that is what we call my friend, that is what we call frequency. So the value of D is going to be wrong. The value of B, the difference in the displacement between a peak and a trough, that is going to be half lambda. Because we know that lambda is from peak to peak or trough to trough. So it's like peak to trough, that's going to be half lambda. The average amount of energy possessed by a wave, well, it's just the average amount of energy possessed by a wave. Like, I don't think it has a special name. It might, but it's not even the amplitude, right? We're just trying to figure out why you, why A, B, or D are wrong. So that's one of the things that I really highly recommend with paper one. Don't just try to find the correct answer, but also try to explain why the other answers are wrong, right? That might show you a lot of a uh, lot of different things. Move on question 23. We'll be given a sound wave of frequency 270. It is recorded on a cathode uh, ray oscilloscope. The wave of foam on the CRO is as shown. What is the time base setting on that CRO? Very important, guys. So, what do you know about time-based settings? What do you know about CRO? Right. We know that the period, okay, the period of a CRO is going to be equivalent to the number, okay, the number of divisions 
right? The number of divisions that you have multiplied by the time base setting, right? So if you want to find the time base setting, you're going to ask yourself, what is your period? Then you're going to ask yourself, what is the number of divisions that you have? Let's go in our case. If a frequency of this, so our value for period is going to be 1 over 270. So already covered, we already have the value of our frequency. So what's next? After we have that value of frequency, we just need to find the time base setting, right? So this is going to be um, 3.7, right? So your value of your period is about going 3.70, okay? 37 times 10 to the power of negative 3. Okay, so we have the value of the period which is going to be 3.7 times 10 to the power of negative 3, like 0, something like that. Okay, the number of divisions is basically the number of divisions taken for one complete oscillation. So if I look here, you have to start here, okay? Then you have to go up, then you're going to go down, then you're going to go up, then you're going to reach this position, right? That's one wavelength, and that's what we want to find, right? So let's start with counting the boxes. This is one centimeter, okay? One centimeter, three centimeter, so that's three centimeters. And then this is four, right? So this is somewhere, okay, so this is about 3.5. So we can just say it's about 3.7, you really can approximate, right? So that you always get the same answer, right? If you just approximate, you just either round it off at the end. So let's say this does 3.7. That's going to give you about 1.0 times 10 to the power of negative 3, which is 1 millisecond, which is going to be a B. Very important. Okay, 24. A motorboat vibrates in water so that it produces a water wave of frequency 0.20. As you can see, we have a motorboat that's going to vibrate and it's producing water waves of frequency 0 0.20. Zero hertz. Now the speed of these waves in the water is 20 milliseconds. Sorry, is 20 meters per second. The motorboat moves with a speed of 5 directly towards a stationary sailing boat. The Doppler effect equation for sound waves also applies for water waves, right? So what is the frequency with which the waves hit the stationary sailing boat? What do we know? Number one, we know that the Doppler effect F note, which is the observed frequency, is going to be Fs times, okay, Fs times V over V plus or minus the velocity of the source. But what you need is the velocity of that source. What is the velocity of your source? The velocity of your source is going to be the velocity of the thing that's producing the sound. In this case, we have a motorboat, as I've said, and it's going to move with a velocity of 5 meters per second. So that is the velocity of your source. And you're going to need one particular keyword that's going to determine if it's going to be plus or minus. This word, directly towards a stationary observer. So whenever it moves directly towards a stationary observer, you're going to subtract. Why? Because the frequency is going to increase. And we know that for this whole thing to increase, we need to make sure that the denominator is as small as possible so that we get a very big value that we can multiply by fs and we can get a bigger frequency. Right. So, but just know that whenever you move directly towards something, it's V minus VS. So whenever you move, okay, towards, it's going to be V minus VS. Then whenever you move away, it's going to be V plus VS. So in this case, your observed frequency, which is the frequency with which the waves hit the stationary sailing boat are going to be, what are you emitting? Which is 0 0.20 times the value of V that you have, which is going to be 20 right, which is the speed of um, the waves in water, basically, divided by 20 minus 5, okay, that's going to give you a value of 0 point, approximately 0 0.2, okay, 66666, six, 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 six. because basically here you have like 0 0.20 times 20 over 15, right, so that's basically going to be 0 0.27, right, so the answer is going to be RD. Let's start with 25, Infrared laser light is used for the transmission of data along optical fibers. What is the typical wavelength of infrared radiation? Guys, I always say this. For this question, you have to know the wavelength and how this thing vary. If you don't know, you can't answer this question accurately. But I'll just give you some of these things so that you can be able to have something that you can rely on. But I would highly recommend find a way to memorize these things that makes easier for you so that you can be able to understand this in a way that that is going to work, right? That's going to work for you. Okay, so let's let's first describe these frequencies, okay? Then we work on how we can be able to apply um, to this particular equation, right? 
So, basically, I need you to get this. So, for question 25, we use this abbreviation, okay, the radio. Right, so this is what we use, and we know that this is going to be, as you go down, this is going to be decreasing, okay, it's going to be decreasing lambda, but it's going to be increasing f. Decreasing lambda, but increasing f. So let's start with radio. What do we know about the ranges of radio? Right, so radio is going to be from 0 0.1 up until about 10 to the power of 6, but it doesn't really matter because they usually say it's just greater than 0 0.1. For microwave, it's going to be from 0 0.1 to about 10 to the power of negative 3. For infrared, it's going to be from 10 to the power of negative 3 to about 7 times 10 to the power of negative 7. For visible light, 4 times 10 to the power of negative 7 to 7 times 10 to the power of negative 7. Okay? 7 times 10 to the power of negative 7. Ultraviolet, what is this going to be? Right? Ultraviolet, this is going to be um, from basically 4 times 10 to the power of negative 7 again. It's going to peak off to about... Um, I think I'll say like 1 times 10 to the power of negative 8. That's much more easier. And this guy will be from 1 times 10 to the power of negative 8 to about 1 times 10 to the power of negative 11. Sometimes negative 13, but negative 11 makes much more sense. 1 times 10 to the power of negative 11 up until 1 times 10 to the power of negative 14 or 16 or it doesn't matter, right? So there's no way to sugarcoat this. There's no way that you can like... Find a shortcut to memorize this. I would highly recommend you sit down, you study these wavelengths, and you're able to understand them much more better, right? But basically, this is what we're looking at whenever we talk of wavelengths and whenever we talk of how they're going to vary. So if we're going to look at infrared, infrared is basically going to be 5 times 10 to the power of negative 5. Yeah, basically, it's from 10 to the power of negative 3 to 10 to the power of negative 7. 10 to the power of negative 5 basically lies in between. So the answer is going to be A. Very important. Move on to question 26. Okay, um, we've been given an elastic string that is attached to an oscillator at one end and clamped at the other end so that the string is horizontal and in tension. Okay, so let's draw this up. Again, I highly recommend, draw some diagrams, right? It makes life so much easier the moment you start drawing your diagram. So let's, let's draw this and let's say this is our oscillator. Okay, so we're going to have a string and we're going to clamp it at one end, right? So it's going to be clamped at this end here. And it's going to be horizontal like that, right? Very important. So the oscillator is made to horizontal, uh, to oscillate vertically. So we're going to oscillate this vertically. The frequency is gradually increased from zero until a stationary wave is set up. So this is how stationary wave in strings works, right? You're going to form a stationary wave for the first time that has a node at one point and a node at the other point. That is like how they work fundamentally. So you're going to have something like this, right? Which is going to be essentially, this is your, again, your oscillator. So you're going to have something like this being produced. And this is going to be your first stationary wave that you're going to, uh, that you're going to form. Okay. So let's move on. The frequency is then increased further to F when the second stationary wave is formed. So let's draw the second stationary wave, right? Again, we have our oscillator over here. But the second one, you just introduce another node. That's how you keep on adding nodes and nodes, right? So for the second one, you're going to have two loops because the second frequency, two, two, right? So you're going to put something like this. Essentially, you're going to clamp it at this particular point, right? So this is going to be, so this is the first one, okay? This is the second one. Then if you go to the third, we've been told that, um, at what frequency does the third stationary wave okay? Okay, so we want to find the frequency at which the third stationary wave is going to occur. So you're going to have, again, one, okay? Then you're going to have two, something like this, right? So basically, okay, let's read more nicely, right? But the wavelength is just going to be the same, okay? Let me make sure that this is just the same because it's going to be the same. So it's going to be something like this. Okay, something like this, right? We have three nodes, right? The length is going to be the same, right? It doesn't make sense to keep on changing the length, right? So, but basically, this is the idea that you should be getting through, right? And this is actually, in A, this is actually lambda over 2. Why? This is a node, and this is a node, and we know for a fact 
that from a node to a node is going to be half lambda. From an antinode to an antinode is going to be half lambda. From a node to a node to another node is going to be lambda. So it means that in two, from a node, right, where there's a node here and another node here, this is going to be lambda. And you know that for effect, for D, we have a node here, we have another node here, we have another node here and another node here. We know that this is going to be lambda and this is going to be half lambda. So in total, you're going to have 3 over 2 lambda. Right. So let's first start with the first one. So for A, right, for A, this is going to be, right, we know that V is going to be F lambda, right, very important. But in this case, right, but in this case, lambda, right, over 2 is going to be your value of L. Because lambda over 2, this is going to be your L from here to here. That's going to be your value of L. So lambda over 2 is literally going to be equal to L. So here you're going to get lambda going to be equivalent to 2L. So you're going to get your value of V is going to be F 2L, right? So this is F0, which is going to be the first one that you're going to start with, right? Very important. Then we're going to move on to the next one, right? Which is going to be the one with an F, right? Which is going to be when you have a second a second session wave, that's where you're going to have F, right? So we know that V is going to be F lambda, but in this case, lambda is going to be L, right? So V is going to be F L right? Basically. But if we're going to move on to 3, right? For 3, we know again V is going to be F lambda. But 3 over 2 lambda is going to be equivalent to L. So lambda is going to be equivalent to 2L to divided by 3. If I substitute this, V is going to be F 2L divided by 3. So I'm going to get 3V divided by 2L is going to be, but this is going to be F3, right? F3, because I already know this, right? But V over L, okay? So this V over L, if I go here, right? I know that F is going to be V over L, right? From this. So I literally, I can substitute this, all of this here, right? So it's going to be 3 over 2 times F, which is going to be F3. So F3 is going to be 1.5 F. And the answer is going to be B. Yeah, so that was a little bit complicated. That's the trick with paper one. It's a lot of work that you have to do to get one mark, right? So most people just give up. But I would highly recommend, if you understand the concept, work through these different questions and get an actual idea of how these things actually work. Move on to question 27. In the experiment, what waves in a ripple tank are incident on a gap, right? Some diffraction is observed, which change would to the experiment would provide a much better demonstration of diffraction. Okay, so increase the amplitude of the waves. This has no effect on the diffraction, right? Increase the frequency of the wave. This is going to decrease the wavelength, right? And we know that for the better demonstration of diffraction, lambda must be as close as possible, right? Lambda must be approximately equal to the value of D. In order for you to have the maximum amount of diffraction occurring that's a fact that's what that's the condition that you're going to need okay so we could increase the width of the gap but that would make sure that lambda and d are nowhere near right so both b and d are wrong the correct answer is c why is c correct because by increasing lambda you're literally going to increase the wavelength of the waves so that they almost close in comparison to the value of um to the value of you know of d Right? So let's assume this. I want you to get this, right? So let's think of this as we have a value of D that is over here, right? Let's assume that we have a value of D that is over here. If I increase my wavelength, it looks something like this. I've increased my wavelength and this lambda is now almost approximately equal to that value of D. Why? Because I keep on increasing the value of my wavelength. So the answer is going to be C. Very important. Move on to question 28. Light of wavelength lambda. Cut here. Move on to question 28. Light of wavelength lambda is emitted from two point sources, R and S. Okay? So at point S, at point P on the screen, sorry, the light intensity is zero. What could explain the light intensity or the zero intensity that is at P. So what's going to happen? 
The wave is going to travel from R until it reaches P. The wave is going to travel from S until it reaches P. So if they're going to meet here and they're going to have zero intensity, when they meet here, if they're going to have zero intensity when they meet here, it means that they're going to meet, okay? They're going to meet out of phase. For them to have zero intensity, they're going to meet out of phase when they arrive at point P, right? So how do they meet out of phase? We have, a certain, we have certain laws that we have to adhere to, rather, because for out of phase, they have to have a path difference that's going to be n plus half lambda, right? So what does it mean? It means that if they're going to differ by lambda, 2 lambda, 3 lambda, 4 lambda, they're going to have const constructive interference. So they're going to meet in phase. If they're going to have a wavelength of like, a path difference of like half lambda, it means that if one wave is like this, right, one wave is like that, half lambda means that the crest of one wave, so maybe it's going to meet like this, and the trough of this is going to meet like this, right? So as you can see here, this, this trough is going to meet that crest over here. And those two are going to have zero intensity because there will be zero amplitude, right? So if they meet out of phase by half lambda, 3 over 2 lambda, 5 over 2 lambda, whenever they just, you know, um, fractions, like half lambda, like half fractions of lambda, they're going to have zero intensity, right? So where do we have this? Light, light source from two forces is emitted with 180 out of phase and the path difference is half lambda. But the method that they already have 180 out of phase, it means that when they arrive at P, they're going to be in phase because they already have a phase difference before. For B, if they emitted in phase and they have a path difference of lambda that's going to be constructive interference so we won't have zero intensity for c they emitted from 90 we never talk of 90 right it, it doesn't make sense we don't even talk of that we talk of 180 things like 360 light from the two sources is emitted in phase which is correct and the path difference is half lambda like i've said so the answer is going to be um going to be d very important okay move on to question 29 we've been given an apparatus that is arranged to show the double slit experiments using a monochromatic light. This, what does monochromatic mean? It means that it has one color, the same frequency basically. The slit separation is 0 0.10 millimeters. The distance from the double slit to the screen where interference pattern is observed is 2.4 and the fringe width is 12. The distance is now changed to 1.8 and the slit separation is doubled. What is the new fringe width? Okay, so what do we know guys? We know that lambda is going to be equivalent to ax divided by d. So I can find my value of lambda, right? Because I know that I have 0 0.10 times 10 to the power of negative 3. My value of x is going to be 12 times 10 to the power of negative 3. My value of d is going to be 2.4. So I'm going to get a value of lambda, which is 0, 5.0 times 10 to the power of negative 7. For the other experiment, I now want to find the value of x, which is going to be lambda times d divided by 2a. Why? Because the slit separation is doubled, okay? So the value of x is going to be uh, lambda, which is 5 times 10 to the power of negative 7 times your value of d, which is going to be 1.8, okay? 1.8 divided by 2 times 0 0.10 times 10 to the power of negative uh, 3. That's going to give you a value of x, which is about 4.5 times 10 to the power of negative 3, which is 4.5 millimeters and the answer is going to be a b move on to question 30 monochromatic light of wavelength 690 passes through a diffraction grating before you go any further whenever you see the word diffraction grating one equation and one equation only must come to mind d sine theta is equivalent to n lambda you're going to use this in some way whenever you see the word like diffraction grating this is going to be applied in one way or the other in this case, this is a concept that I want to teach you, which is about finding the greatest number of maxima that can be observed. It's one co concept that's very, very important. Whenever you want to find the maxima and every single thing, you have to always use this concept, right? The greatest value of theta that you can form is going to be 90. And that's a fact because this theta can actually be 90, right? Like this, maybe when considering this, this theta can actually be 90 degrees, right? So whenever we've been asked the greatest number, always use d sine theta with theta 
is going to be equivalent to 90. So in this case, theta is going to be 90 degrees. The value of D is going to be, if you have 300 lines in one millimeter, okay? So if 300 lines give you one millimeter, what about one line? How wide is one line? So it's going to be one over 300 times one millimeter, 10 to the power of negative three. Very important. And the value of N, that's what we want to find. The value of lambda is 690 times, okay, times 10 to the power of negative 9. So, the value of n is going to be d sine theta divided by lambda, which is 1 over 300 times 10 to the power of negative 3 times sine 90 divided by, okay, lambda, which is 690 times 10 to the power of negative 9. It's going to give you a value of n that's going to be approximately okay approximately about 4.83 and the trick with this is you always take the whole number you don't round it off to five you take four because theta is very large and you can't form five because literally you're going to end at 4.83 so the trick is you always run down so you're going to have four okay but this is the value of n this is four guys from the zero order you always measure theta from the zero order the zero order is going to be here you're going to measure your value of theta. So you're going to have 1, 2, 3, 4. Then you're done, right? You're also going to have that on the same side. 1, 2, 3, 4. Then you're done. So in total, how much do you have? Your 4, 1, which is the bright one at the center, and 4 on the other side. So the total is going to be 4 plus 4 plus 1, which is 8 plus 1, which is going to give you 9. And the answer is going to be a D. Question 31. Okay, this is an electric fields question. We no longer do electric fields. Moving on to question 32. Cut. You've been asked, which two units are used to define the volt? You might ask yourself, what is the volt? Right? We know that voltage, in other words, is going to be the work done, okay, per unit charge. The work done is measured in joules. Charge is measured in coulombs, okay? So voltage is going to be joule and coulomb that are going to be used to define the volt, right? So it's going to be Joe and Coulomb. So move on to question 33. The graph shows the variation with the length of resistance of a uniform metal wire. The gradient of the graph is G. The wire is a cross-section of the area A. Which expression can be used to calculate the resistivity of the metal wire? What do we know? We know that R is going to be given to rho L divided by A. And what do you want to find? We want to find the resistivity. But we've plotted a graph of R, which is going to be rho over A multiplied by L. The general equation of a straight line is Y is equivalent to M X plus C. But what is plus C? Plus zero. So C is zero, L is X, rho over M is going to be your gradient. But your gradient has a value, which is going to be G, right? So rho over A is going to be equivalent to G. So your resistivity is going to be the gradient that you get times your area and the answer is going to be a move on to question 34 diagram one contains a lamp connected to a supply through two switches during repairs an electrician right our electrician is going to come and reverse the connection x1 and z1 okay so that z1 is connected like this right so that z1 is connected to that supply okay and um, Z1 is connected to the supply like this, right? Like here. This is what we're talking about. And X1 to the other switch at Z2, which is something like here, right? So we have those two connections as shown in diagram two. Which switch positions will now light the lamp? So guys, we need to understand what's going on here. Firstly, let's study diagram two. If our current is going to start here, right? It's going to move and move and move and move and move and move. Okay, it's going to move and move and move and move and move. Which is here. Can it pass through? It can because X1 allows it to pass. It's going to pass through. Okay, so it's going to pass through and it's going to move and move and move and move. Okay, it's going to move and move and move and move and move and move. But it reaches here. There's nothing. There's literally nothing that's connecting this to this. So the problem now is you have to score switch around the switches until you get the correct answer until light reaches that 
a light bulb, right? Very interesting. So let's make possible connections and try to find which one will now light that lamp, right? Let's start with A. Okay, so let, let, let's get this. Let, let, let's investigate. Okay, so they're going to remove X1 and Z1. Then they're going to go to X, Y, 2, Y1. So let's remove this. Okay, then let's connect X1 to Y1. Okay, let's investigate this. And then they're going to connect X2 to Y2. X to Y2, yeah, something like this, okay? So let's go start again. It's going to move and 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 move, okay? Reaches here, there's nothing. It cannot pass through, right? So A is wrong. Because by making those connections, I will not allow any current to reach this value. But if it's going to come here, it's going to go here and here and here and here. Then it's going to reach here. It can't get out. So that's wrong, right? So A is possibly wrong. Okay, let's move on to B. They say again, X1 to Y1. Okay, so let's remove this, right? Let's put X1 to Y1. So X1 is here. Let's put it to Y1 like this. Then X2 to Z2. Okay, so we want to put X2 to Z2. Okay, so X2 to Z2. So let's remove here and put X2 to Z2. Okay, so this is X2 to Z2. Again, we still have that same problem, right? It's going to go here. Nothing. The circuit is not complete, meaning that B is going to be wrong. Okay. Moving on to C. X1 to Z1. X1 to Z1, like that. Leave it like that, okay? X2 to Y2, leave it like that. Again, same problem, guys. It's going to move here and here and here and here and here and here. And it's going to go out. There's nothing that's going to complete its path. That is not possible. Let's move on to the last answer. D X1 to Z1. X1 to Z1. X2 to Z2. X2 to Z2. Okay, so let's remove it here. Right? Let's connect X2 to Z2. Something like this. Then now let's follow. It's going to start here and here and here and here and here. Okay, then it's going to move. Then it's going to reach this point. Voila. The light bulb is going to light. Okay, why? Because now current can reach it, right? It continues and continues, continues, then it reaches its power supply. The journey is now complete. Because we have completed this path, we have made the journey complete. So the answer is going to be D. Move on to question 35. We've been given a, a, power uh, a wire that supplies a shower heater with a current of 35 and has a resistance of 25. Okay, what is the power dissipated in the heater? What do we know? Guys, we know that power is equal to work done per uh, unit time, okay? But we know that from our previous equations, right, the voltage is the work done per unit charge, okay? But charge is going to be I times T. So work done is going to be VIT. So your power is going to be VIT divided by T. So P is going to be VI. But P is also equivalent to I squared R. Why? Because V is going to be equivalent to I R. Okay? So P, your power here, right, is going to be literally 35 squared times 25 times 10 to the power of negative 3. That's going to give you a power of 31 watts, which is going to be A. Very important. Move on question 36. A student has a set of identical cells and identical lamps. Okay? The cells have negligible internal resistance. A lamp is connected to a cell with normal brightness, right? What happens when the student connects the lamp and the cells as shown? Okay, very interesting. Right. I have a trick when it comes to these questions of brightness. Um, that is, you look at power. Whenever you talk of brightness, you have to look always at power. Now, you might be asking, what, what does he mean when he say power? Well, the greater the power, basically, the more brighter it's going to be. That's how I think about this, right? The greater the power is going to be more brighter, okay? The lower the power, okay, it's going to be what? Less bright, right? If you have the same power, okay, you're going to have the same brightness. So first of all, that's how we first think about brightness, right? Whenever you have questions that are like, comment on the brightness, uh, like that and that, always think about what's happening to the power, okay? 
And then when you think about that, the brightness is as a consequence of the power. So how do I calculate the power? Now, guys, my trick is assume values. Whenever you're given physics questions, especially electricity equations, it's very hard to work with equations. To make life easier for you, always assume values. Let's assume this is a two-volt supply. A two-volt supply. And let's assume that all resistors are one ohm resistor. So here we have one ohm resistor, and here we have a one ohm resistor, and here we have a one ohm resistor. Right. I can find the power here, right? Already I can see I have a bit of a V and a bit of an I, right? I know that power is equal to V squared over R, okay? This is going to be V, which is 2 squared divided by 1, which is going to be 4 watts. Okay, so if I go here in the setup, if 1 is less than 4, what's going to happen? It's going to be less bright. If 1 is greater than 4, what's going to happen? It's going to be more bright. If 1 is equal to 4, what's going to happen? It's going to be having the same brightness. Same with 2 and 3. If 2 has the same power, it's going to have the same brightness. Lower power, it's going to have a lower brightness. Higher power is going to have a higher brightness. Basically, that's how it works. Now, what happens when the student connects the lamp and the cells? Okay, what's going to happen? Now, get this. Let's go back again to our simulation. We have two volts here. We have two volts here. We're going to apply Kirchhoff's laws, right? So I'm going to draw it much, much bigger so that we can be able to apply the laws very easily. Let me redraw this, right? So we have something basically like this. Okay, so it's going to be like this so that it's much bigger and we can work with it. Okay. Okay, so we have something like this. Okay, and then something like this. Then something like this, right? So something like this. Okay, this is what we have, right? It's a bit uh, rough, but it's, it, it'll make it prove the point. Okay, so we have two volts here. Then we have two volts here. We have one ohm here, one ohm here, and one ohm here. I need you to follow through, guys. We're going to apply two laws. We're going to start with um, Kirchhoff's first law, and then we're going to move to Kirchhoff's second law, right? We're just going to alternate. Okay, so let's first start. Let's call this current I1, okay? This is the same that's going to move here, and the same that's going to move here, which is going to be I1. Then let's call this that's coming out of this I2. It's going to be the same that's going to flow through here, which is going to be I2, which is the same that's going to enter here, and it's going to be I2. But here, it's different. It's going to branch, right? Since here is a junction, current will branch in two directions, this direction and this direction. So this direction is not going to be equal to I2, but rather the difference of I2 and I1, because it's going to branch, right? So this one, this one is going to be I2, subtract I1, right? The current that's going to flow through here. And why is this? Because if I2 is the provi is providing current entering to the junction, and we're already given that one of the junction is I1, Therefore, the other one should have I2, which is the total current, minus I1, right? Which is I2 minus I1. Follow, follow through, right? So let's call the loop consideration. Now, we can consider the bigger loop, right? The biggest loop of all, which is like this loop, okay? This whole loop, right, is the first loop that we can consider. Okay, so when you're considering that big loop, how do you go about this, right? We apply Kirchhoff's laws in this way, Okay. Since we have a 2 that is over there, right, and another 2 that is over there, that's going to give you a value of 4, right? So you use that E is equal to, right, the summation of E is going to be given to the summation of I, right? So your summation of E is going to be 4. If you start here, it's going to be I1 times 1, right, because that's IR, okay? If you move here, this is going to be plus I2 times 1. So your value of 4 is going to be equivalent to I1 plus I2. So I don't know what I1 is. I don't know what I2 is. But what I know is if I add the 2, I'm going to get 4. I can consider another loop, right? This smaller loop over here. Then I go back over here. I can just consider this loop, right? What's my power source in this loop? It's 2. That's going to be equal to, if I move here, this is going to be I1 times 1, which is just going to be I1 times 1. Okay, plus, if I move here, this is going to be I2 minus I1, okay, times 1, right? So you're going to get 2, which is going to be I1 
plus I2 minus I1. All right, and these two are equal. So basically, basically, 2 is going to be equivalent to I2. But what do I know, guys? What do I know? 2 is I2. I also know that I1 plus I2 is equals to 4. So if 2 is I2, what is I1? Right, what is I1? So I1 is going to be equivalent to 2, and I2 is going to be equivalent to 2. So I2 minus I1 is going to give you 0. Right? So no current is going to flow through this light 2. Okay? So no current is going to flow through here. But here we're going to have 2. And here we're going to have 2. So how do I find my power here? Power is equals to I squared R. Which is going to be 2 squared times 1. I'm going to give you 4. Right? This one is going to be again I squared times R. 2 squared times 1 which is going to give you again 4 watts. Is 4 watts not the same as this 4 watts? It is. So... Lamp 1 and 3 are going to light with normal brightness, and the answer is C. Very, very, very complicated. But that's a problem with paper 1, right? It's a lot of working for just one mark, but you have to try so that you can be able to answer as many questions as you possibly can. Move on to question 37. We've been given a potential divider circuit, and we've been asked to find the resistance of, um, of the resistor uh, that is in the potential divider. How does this work? So, current share... Um, So basically, the voltage is shared on the basis of the resistance that you have. The bigger your voltage, the bigger the resistance that you get. So we can use this formula to find the value of R. We know that if we say R over R plus 150 times 12, we're supposed to get 5. Okay, so 5 over 12, right, is going to be equivalent to R over R plus 150. Therefore, 5 R plus 150 is going to be equivalent to 12R. So 5R is going to be 5R plus, okay, so 5R plus 5 times 150, that's going to be equivalent to 12R. Okay, 5, 12R minus 5R, that's going to be 7R, which is going to be 5 times 150. Okay, 5 times 150. So your value of R is going to be 5 times 150 divided by the value of 7. Right, 5 times 150 divided by uh, the value of 7. So for 37, the answer is going to be 107 um, ohms. And the answer is going to be B. Very important. Moving on to question 38. We've been given two cells which have an EMF of 3 and 1.4. And we've been asked to find the current in the 9 ohm resistor. Okay, so we've been given that it is in, in negligible internal resistance. And it's connected to resistors of resistance 9 and resistance 18. Okay, so how do we... How do you go about this one, right? Again, create a loop, right? This is your loop that you are considering. Okay. So if that's the loop that you're considering, we don't need the other loop, right? So let's just remove this loop to avoid confusion, right? So that you understand better. It's much more like this, right? So how do I find the value of I that is going to go there? Again, let's start here. It's going to go get here. So it's going to be 3. Summation of E is going to be the summation of IR. So it's going to be 3 is going to be equivalent to, this one is going to be 9 times I, okay? Then it's going to go back here, but this is trying to push current in this direction. So, we're going to subtract, right? We're going to subtract 3 and 1.2, right? Whenever you oppose, whenever EMF is opposed, you subtract it. So it's going to be 3 minus 1.2, so that you can be able to get that value that you need. And 3 minus 1.2 is going to give you 1.8 is going to be 9i, so your value of i is going to be 1.8 divided by 9, which is going to be 0 0.2 amps, and the answer is going to be a b. Move on to question 39. What is the correct estimate of the order of magnitude of the diameter of a typical atomic nuclei? And the diameter, I'm sorry guys, you just have to know this by head, is going to be 10 to the power of negative 14. These are values that you can find in your test book, but these are things that you're expected to know as a student, right? We can calculate these things by finding the mass and estimating the density of an atom, but it's way, way complicated. I'd recommend the diameter of an atom nucleus. You need to know this by head. The diameter of an atom, you need to know this by head, like about 10 to the power of negative 10. These are things that you need to know as a student who does physics, right? So that your life is much, much easier. Whenever you see a question like this, you know you know the answer, right? It's about 10 to negative 14, 10 to the power of negative 15, somewhere basically around those lines. 
Question 14. Which segment base describes beta negative decay in terms of the simple quark model? I always say this, guys. My trick is very simple. Beta negative. Think about this. Then you have beta positive. Right? Beta negative starts with an N. It means that a neutron turns into a proton. Beta positive starts with a P. It means that a proton turns into a neutron. And that's what I use, right? So I no longer need to think. I know that a neutron in the neutron is a down quark that's changing into an up quark. And an electron, electron is released, but an electron anti-neutrino, which is an anti-meta isotope, is also released. And my answer is going to be um, A. Very important. So thank you guys for watching. Um, I hope you really saw that paper one is really complicated. Like, look at all these calculations just for one mark. It's very, very complicated. But there's nothing that you can't master with practice. You have to practice a lot of past papers. Like, look at all, all this calculation just for one mark, right? So you have to practice. Practice a lot of past papers so that you can familiarize yourself with these concepts and with time you'll be able to master them. But I hope it made sense. If you have any comments, put them down in the comment section below. And I've attached the paper that I've just worked out in my description. I would highly recommend that you check that out so that you can be able to work it out. And thank you guys for watching. I'll see you in the next one.